good. This can be. Okay. Okay, we are live. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Fertility Talk Live, and we again got Dr. Q. Um, it's always lovely having Dr. Q, and it's always a fun episode when we're doing, when we're talking to Dr. Q, and I know you've got, it's like you've got so much fans, doctor. Um, oh, <laughs> you've got yeah. lots of fans. So That's thank flattering. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. Um, and we're talking about uh, quite a good topic, which is blocked fallopian tubes. And I know we do this topic quite a bit, um, but it's, again, it's something that I think you almost see daily. Um, and it's something that must be spoken about. So um, I'm going to let you first introduce yourself. Um, tell us about where you are, what it is that you do. Um, yeah, just talk to us, doctor. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks for having me back again, Leanne. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, it's been a very hectic season or a hectic year for me. Um, but yeah, to those that are joining us, I'm Dr. Q. Uh, that's how most of my patients call me. Uh, full name being Dr. Emisile Diale. Uh, born and bred in Durban and um, yeah, located in Pretoria currently. I work as an obstetrician and gynecologist and I've super specialized into reproductive medicine. So as um, our company goes, I work with a Family Matters Fertility Center as a fertility specialist there. And as our logo goes, making babies is our art. So we help um, families to be established. We help uh, people to start their families, get babies, connect them to donors, investigate what could be the cause of the infertility and then uh, treat accordingly. So yeah, I'm looking forward to today. Awesome. So um, if you see me looking down, I'm just checking on comments on, on our page and see who all um, live with us and watching us. So if you guys have any questions while we're doing the talk, please put it in the comment section. I will be checking all the time to see if anyone's asked a question. And at the end of the talk, if we've got a few minutes left, we'll obviously ask Dr. Q um, and she will also leave her details at the end of the talk. Um, to let you know how you can get hold of her. So Dr. Q, <clears throat> as we're saying, we are talking about blocked fallopian tubes. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to actually start off besides asking you what it is and to explain exactly what it is. One important mm -hmm. thing I'd really like to, to ask you is, um, or to touch on is what to do when you do have blocked fallopian tubes. Um, because a lot of women, what I'm getting is a lot of women are asking what medication can they take when their, their tubes are blocked? Um, mm -hmm. And maybe we can just emphasize on it what exactly it is and how you cannot actually conceive when, when your tubes are you know, completely blocked and stuff. So I just want mm -hmm. you to, to get it out there to these women um, what their next steps are and so forth. But again, what is blocked fallopian tubes? Okay. So maybe we can start by asking what are fallopian tubes before they get blocked? What do they do? What are they for? Why do we need them? And why, if they are a problem, is having a baby a problem? Can't I just have a baby with those blocked fallopian tubes, you know? Yeah. Um, I wish I had a model here. Um, let's see. Um, is it visible? Yeah, um, yeah. Not? Okay. Let me, now that we are talking mostly about it, but um, I'll just show a picture that I usually use when I'm educating my patients. So if we look here, we've got a model of... Um, the uterus and um, from there we've got the uterus we've got this which is called the fallopian tubes and then we've got the ovaries okay so the ovaries release the seeds which make the baby 
And they released the seed and it waits here just at the beginning of the fallopian tube, the area we call the ampulla. Now the fallopian tube is more like a bridge. It connects the, 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 the egg and the sperm and that's where they actually meet. And that's where the baby is actually made. So the sperm comes in, it's dropped at the level of the vagina and it has to swim. That's why also semen analysis is important if couples are struggling to fall pregnant. The sperm has a long way to travel. And when it goes through the womb, it goes through the fallopian tube as well. And it goes towards the end of the fallopian tube and that's where it actually meets the egg. And that's where the baby is formed. So this is like the bridge, it's like the factory. Then that's why it actually plays such a big role as far as a baby making is concerned. So if you don't have that bridge that connects the egg and sperm or the factory where the baby is actually made, because baby is made here in the fallopian tube, then therefore it becomes difficult to conceive. So that's why fallopian tubes are actually very important. So what do we mean when they are blocked? So one of the investigations that we do is to check, uh, as part of checking why a couple struggling to conceive, um, is to check the fallopian tubes. We do the bloods to check the hormones, we check the ovaries, we look at the womb, we do the semen analysis, and part of the workup is to actually assess the fallopian tube, the actual factory. Is it open or is it blocked? Um, if the factory is closed, then unfortunately, um, we need to find other ways of actually conceiving. So um, the one way that we test fallopian <clears throat> tube is through what we call a hysterosalpingogram. In short, we call it an HSD. So this is an X-ray that also is done um, on, on the female to check the fallopian tubes. So she goes into an x-ray department. I just have an image again that I use for my patients. I'm just gonna pull it out as well. She goes into the x-ray department as if they're doing a pap smear, you know, you open your legs. Then they put in a small catheter um, through the mouth of the womb and then they push in a dye. And then this dye should be visible on x-ray, they take x-ray. So this dye, they push it in and it goes through, through the canal and then it goes through the fallopian tube and it comes out, it flows out. So we call it spillage into the pelvic cavity. So that is good. And it shows that the fallopian tubes are open. But if the dye gets stuck and there's no further flow, it doesn't go through the rest or show the rest of the anatomy of the tube. It doesn't cause the spillage. Then it is taken as the tube is blocked. So that is the HSG. And when the tube is blocked, it, or the dye does not go through. It also signifies that the sperm will not go through to meet the waiting egg on the other side. So that's why um, then you find that fertilization it does not take place and therefore no pregnancy if the fallopian tube is blocked. So that's the HSG. Another way of actually testing the fallopian tubes will be through a surgical procedure, which is called a laparoscopy. So most times though, we'll do the laparoscopy if we're suspecting adhesions or endometriosis or cysts and other illnesses um, that um, when we intervene, then um, we can also then just check the fallopian tubes and treat at the same time. So we also put a dye just like uh, the HSG and then um, or just fluid. And then when we see the flow on both ends of the fallopian tube, then it means that um, the tubes are patent, the, the, the dye or the fluid can flow through, meaning the sperm can reach there, meaning the baby can be made, the factory is still running. Okay, so that's basically what fallopian tubes um, are for and um, how do we know when they are blocked? Um, that's how we diagnose it. Okay, so um, the other question, uh, the next question is, what is it that you would suggest after someone finds out um, you've done the HSG and you found out that your tubes are blocked, what is the next step? <clears throat> okay, so um, it depends as to 
what are the complete findings? Um, there is a, a process or findings where you find that one fallopian tube is blocked, for example. Um, and if the other <coughs> tube is still uh, patent but, or open. Sorry, doctor, but your, your camera is off. Oh, is it? What happened? <laughs> there we go. It's okay. on. Back on. <laughs> okay. Apologies for that. Thanks. No worries. I didn't press anything, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so technology. Um, so uh, if you find that only one fallopian tube is blocked, they are still, and, and uh, the, the, the second tube is not diseased. Um, maybe a lady who's had an ectopic or things like that, um, then there are still possibilities that that one tube that is found to be normal can still mm -hmm. function. But if it delays you and a year goes by and you're not falling pregnant, then the next steps need to be taken into account or considered. Yeah. And um, again, especially on HSG, if it's found that it's the proximal part of the tubes, the first part of the tube, um, the tube we divided into, into four parts. Um, the very first part that is close to the, what we call the cornua or the edges of the, the uterus. If the proximal part of the tubes is reported to be blocked, at times it can be spasms um, or it can be a mucus plug that's there. So there is a procedure that can be done by interventional radiologists. Um, and this is um, called fallopian tube recanalization. Not a lot of centers actually do this. Um, mm -hmm. And it's only for selected few cases where, um, as I said, it's proximal obstruction. There's no hydrocelpings or swelling of the tubes and fluid collections and all of that. Um, so the recanalization, they can do it. It's a same day procedure. They go in, they are able to visualize the inside of the womb. They put in a fine guide wire and then they put in a, a catheter through and then they flush it with saline to remove if it's just a mucus plug or anything like that. So recanalization can be achieved through that process. Um, where in centers where it's available and if it's not severe damage to the fallopian tubes. Okay, and then if the tubes are blocked merely because maybe one had gone through a sterilization um, where, you know, life happens, um, people get married, they have kids and things are going well, they are happy with their two kids, they sterilize, and then life happens. It's either you lose the kid or the partner, or you change your mind. Um, we do meet couples that after a couple of years, they've changed their minds and they'll like baby number three or baby number four. So we may we are able to make that happen for them if they would choose to re-anastomose or reconnect the two ends of the tubes. But but that also has its own prerequisites, you know, and um, its own success rate, depending on the age of the woman, depending on the ovarian reserves of the woman, because it means she's saying she wants to fall pregnant naturally, you know, and depending on what we find intra-op as well. We need to find a tube at least that's more than four centimeters in length that we can still re anastomose the two ends the 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 finger like end of the fallopian tubes which mm -hmm. is holding onto the ovary must still be intact because that's what grabs the egg and brings it in okay so those things must still be intact and um so those are most of the things that sometimes you know you go in you're going to re anastomose and you find that the surgeon that did it maybe during the caesar the surgeon that did the sterilization took everything like the whole fimbria and everything is gone. They made sure no babies are coming here anymore, only to find now that we are already in theater. You're going to pay for that theater time. You're going to pay for everything, but you don't achieve the purpose that we went in there for. Um, so those are the things that we can only detect once we are uh, in theater. So re-anastomosis can be done. Um, we've had a few cases of success where uh, babies were born after re-anastomosis if we find that everything was 
um, intact. Maybe it was just the clip that was used. That's even better. We just remove the two edges and reconnect and then um, you get success. The success rate is actually um, not that high though. And um, there's also a risk of an ectopic. We've had a case as well where we re-anesthemosed and the patient had to be rushed to, the patient did fall pregnant, but unfortunately it was an ectopic pregnancy because that area already forms as a bottleneck in terms of the trapping of the embryo. So, um, um, then ectopics can also happen from re-anastomosis um, surgery. Okay, and then um, the other methods though that we offer uh, patients if there is um, collection of fluid in the fallopian tube is to say, because some women will say, look, there's fluid collections, it causes inflammation in the womb and it's bad. Even though you go through IVF, this can be toxic. It can cause a toxic environment because this fluid that is in the tube um, causes inflammation and it's not good for the baby to grow in such an environment. So yeah. um, then we recommend that we either put clips and separate the tube from the uterus, uh, or we do a scalping gostomy, which is making a hole on the part where the swelling is, and we allow the fluid to drain freely um, so that the patient is not in pain and so that there's not further accumulation of the fluid as well. So we make a small incision on the, on, on the tube and we are able to cause um, a new drainage system um, on the tube. Okay, then there's one, one, sorry, were you saying something, doctor? Um, I just wanted to explain the last option, okay. um, which is available for the patients, because remember, um, these things, <laughs> these surgeries, patients need to pay for them cash. Yeah. Um, most medical aids don't cover it. And then if you really look at it, if we had to go and re-anesthemose or reconnect the fallopian tubes, it's plus minus 60,000 rand in the uh, private sector. And that's more or less the cost of in vitro fertilization. Yeah. And then you need to go back again and close the tubes again, you know, after the delivery or if it ends up being successful. And you can spend that 60,000 and there's a higher chance that, a higher chance that maybe we can get in there and the procedure is unsuccessful and you've already paid. So the uh, option that then most patients end up going for is to go for uh, in vitro fertilization if the fallopian tubes are blocked. Okay, I never actually thought of it that way. Um, I've got one other question. It's a very important question because um, it's what I get a lot is, is there any medication available out there, um, whether it be um, you know, something over the counter or it's something that the doctor prescribed for someone who's got blocked fallopian tubes? Is there anything that they can take? Mm. You know, unfortunately, fallopian tubes are very hard to reach, okay? <laughs> Um, imagine the opening of the fallopian tube is inside your tummy, the one opening, and then the other opening is at the vaginal opening, you know, that's the connection. So we don't have medication that can go in through the vagina, go mm. through the cervix, which is tightly closed like this, yes. and go all the way through the uterus and be able to reach the fallopian tubes um, in their high, small, narrow passages, you know? Yeah. So there's no um, clinically or medically recommended medication that has been found to be able to reach the blocked fallopian tubes and unblock them. Um, but I do know there are centers that have claims that by you steaming with their medication, the steam goes through the vagina, it goes through the cervix, it goes through the uterus and it reaches the fallopian tubes and it's able to somehow unblock the fallopian tubes. Unfortunately, we don't have any scientific um, evidence of such. Yeah. We don't have studies that actually confirm such. And we do have patients who um, maybe say, you know, possibly placebo effects 
um, you find that they've been using whatever and then fall pregnant, you know? Yeah. So um, there's no evidence medically that um, I, as a medical doctor, can say, yeah, this is the drug or this is the medication or whatever yeah. that can unblock your tubes. Yeah, so I, I, I reason why I ask this, I get the question a lot and say, um, can I recommend medication in the, for blocked fallopian tubes? And the first thing I say to them, please go and see a fertility specialist because there's mm. nothing that I know of that's on the market that you could possibly take to unblock it. And I always have to explain that, you know, the egg and the sperm needs to meet and it won't happen. Mm -hmm. So no matter what other medication you're taking, if you've got mm -hmm. blocked fallopian tubes, it's not going to help. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so I'm just, this is mainly to confirm and let patients know that if your tubes are blocked, please see a fertility specialist and they know what to do and, and they can help you further on. So we've got a few questions, Doc. Um, I'm just going to take one or two. We don't have a lot of time. Um, Okay, if you find that the tubes are blocked, do you have to do it? Okay, so if you find that the tubes are blocked, do you have to do the HSG test again? That was from Vukani. Um, maybe you can just confirm that? Um, it depends. How did you find that the fallopian tubes are blocked? If it was through HSG or laparoscopy, that confirms it. Save your money towards um, your next treatment level, which most likely will be IVF. IVF, okay. No awesome. need yeah. yeah okay i've got another one if i hi if i if block tubes are found before my 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 amectomy can tubes be open afterwards if tubes are blocked before a myomectomy can they be open after yes um i i'm not sure if i get the question correctly but um i would just I'll just take it that I understand, um, regardless of a myomectomy or, or not, I don't think the myomectomy will be playing a role. If, if the tubes were blocked or from sterilization, yes, recanalization can be done, as I explained, um, or reanastomosis and joining of the tubes. But again, it's very costly. Um, and then, no, there's no methods that are also even associated with the myomectomy that are available to unblock the tubes. Okay. Okay, there's a really good question. How do you know when you have toxic fluid in your tubes? By doing the hysterosalpingogram, which is the HSG, it is able to tell that there is fluid accumulation because the, the tube then extends and balloons up and then it becomes huge and it swells. And then the HSG is able to tell that this is a solid tube. Also, if there is fluid, we are also able to see, we are naturally not supposed to be able to see a healthy fallopian tube on sonar. But the moment the tube is collecting fluid, it distends and it gets really quite big. And we are able to see uh, the fluid that is collecting in the tube. And we see a sausage shaped like structure, which is uh, fluid filled. And we are able to tell that they, this is fluid. Okay, okay, our last question is, um, I have blocked tubes prior to finding this out, ovulation was painful. After ovulation, meds were taken. Can doctor explain the cause of the pain? I have blocked okay. fallopian tubes. Prior to finding this out, ovulation was painful. After ovulation, meds were taken. Okay, ovulation was pain. Look, the pain could be associated with the blocked fallopian tubes um, because um, I think her linking of the pain with the diagnosis as well, because uh, the tubes also secrete natural fluids and these fluids need to drain out as well. So, uh, or, or there could be infection in the, in the fallopian tube that causes and collects all these toxic cells. So this is what, as I said um, earlier, that we make a hole on the fallopian tube to, be, to allow it to drain the fluid out. If it's not drained, it distends. It's like having an abscess. And that is actually um, quite painful. Okay. 
Okay, doctor, thank you very much for this talk. If you guys have any other questions, you can contact Dr. Q. Um, you can email her or, and I think it's the admin at... Um, Dr.Q.co.za. Yeah. Yeah. Full word. Admin at dr.q.co.za. Um, and if you are dealing with infertility, are you and uh, maybe doctor can give you her details, um, you can actually contact doctor and go and have treatments done with her. Doctor, please give us your details of how they can contact you. Okay, we are found uh, on um, uh, Family Matters, our website, Family Matters. Um, with uh, family-matters.co.za. All our details are there. We are also on Instagram, family matters fertility underscore center, um, and on Facebook as a full family matters fertility center. Okay, and awesome. our phone number is 012-677-8116. Um, Thank okay, you so <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for taking your time. Um, we normally, you normally get a call between someone is, is having a baby at some point. <laughs> so it's like, wow, you know, what? But this is no a good time. This Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday. Okay, thank you very much, doctor. Have a great weekend and thank you everybody that's joined us today. Um, we'll chat okay. to you guys soon. Bye. Okay, same, same. Bye. Bye.